There's times in our life where we go through trials, tribulations, we go through things that are super stressful, a, a struggle. And, um, and, then, and then there's times when things are really good, right? And there's times where everything's just like, just great. And we're like, why would, you, why would I read any scriptures about, oh Lord, help me, I'm in distress or whatever it may be. But live another week and um, hey, something might happen, you never know. But God's always on the throne, so that's good. But I want to read from Psalm 40. And it says this. Uh, this is David. Uh, David was a man, obviously, who who did. Uh, he, you know, he he grew up and he was anointed king. But then he also did some dumb things, made some really terrible mistakes when he was younger, and then made some other terrible mistakes when he was older. But yet God was faithful and God restored certain things in his life. But this is what he says. He says, "I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me." And heard my cry. See, David, there was, there's these like cries that David has. And, and David is acknowledging, saying, listen, like, God, you inclined your ear to me. You heard me. You heard when I cried. And I think there's, like, there's, some of us know that feeling. But then there's other people who, who just, who cry to the Lord. But yet, they're like, I don't think he hears me. And, and so, like, David begins to just continue on, and he says, He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. And so David is speaking from a place of, um, of, of just, like, just pure understanding of how and what God does in our life. It's interesting because there's certain things that God does that we oftentimes can't really see, but we see the outflow of it, right? If you, for example, there's, um, it says the Holy Spirit is like the wind. You cannot see it, but you see the effects of it. You don't know where it goes. It goes wherever it wants. Wherever the Spirit of the Lord, there's freedom. And so you see these effects of the wind when you look outside. And even last night, you, saw, you heard the wind and, and whatnot. And, and you see all the effects of it. But you never really just, you can, you can never grab a hold of it. You can never touch it. You can never just like, just, you, you, it's like it's like sometimes you just want to like wrap your arms around God, but he's just not tangibly there. However, David is literally saying, I'm telling you the effects of what he did. He set my feet on a rock. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. And then he continues on in verse 11. He says, As for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy for me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. For evils have encompassed me beyond number. And I'm sure no one has had evils encompass them of beyond number. There's things in our life that may be tangibles or intangibles, and they encompass our minds they may be words that people say. They may be actions that we've done. They may be things, repercussions of what we've done. But here's the issue is that there's evil that, pers- that, that resides in this world. And by default, we're humans and we bear the brunt of that. Whether we're a believer or whether we're not a believer. The reality is evil exists and we will, we will feel the effects of that. And sometimes, even as a believer, if you, if you want to fast forward some other time to, to Revelation 12, you will literally see this, this imagery of Satan. He says, uh, it's like this, it's this imagery of the, the woman and the dragon and the, and the child uh, of this woman. And it's this imagery of, of Satan and this imagery of God's seed. And it says that Satan poured out his wrath. And the term for this poured out this wrath is the most vile sexual, disgusting uh, imagery of this wrath that's being poured out. You can read it later on. Read it tonight when you go back home. And so it's not just like wrath was poured out. It was like the most disgusting, vile, and it's in a sexual nature, the most raunchy way. And it's like, how filthy could this be? And this is what is being poured out on God's people, right? Because it says that he knows that his time is short, And so, yes, there's evil that encompasses, but here's what's super interesting. Even in Revelation, it refers back to what David is saying, and it says that the the vial is poured out, and it goes down, but yet, right before it gets to God's anointed, a chasm opens up and swallows the filth. Do you see, like, how God protects? I mean, David talks about it. 
But yet, there's an understanding, even the last days, and, and it, when, when, when evil is all around, if we are a child of God, there is the ability to have that wrath swallowed up even before it touches us. Do you see this? And, and, and what's, what's really interesting is David continues on. He's essentially declaring this. And he says, For evil has encompassed me beyond number. My iniquities have overtaken me. I'm sure no one could say that. Define iniquities. I'm glad you asked. Sin, our dumb decisions. Things that just really just are not of God. It says, Have overtaken me and I cannot see. Have you ever done things so much that you just can't even see the presence of God anymore? Have you ever like just been so, I guess, so far gone? I think that's like a correct term, right? I have, right? And where, where, you, where we just persist within our iniquities, we persist within our, our sin and like, I mean, hate that word. Let me just define sin for a moment, Right? Sin in our terms, in the church term, we would say, oh, sin, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that, don't wear this, don't do, right? Sin, great. Let me just articulate it in a little bit better way. Sin is an obstacle that divides you and God. So it's not a thing, it's not a tangible. It's not something that you do or don't do. It's the outcome of an action or behavior of a heart motive that puts a block up in between us and God. And so when we're looking at sin and saying, hey, don't sin, I, I would ar argue that that's a very incorrect statement to say. I would actually argue and say, hey, um, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind so that no sin or no blockades enter up in between us and him. And what's interesting is, is we do this and these iniquities overcome us and like all of a sudden we just can't see. Why? Because there's a blockade. Even if God is good, which he is, and even if he's working in our life, which he always is, sometimes we just can't see it. Why? Because there's blockades. There's things that we do that erect this massive great wall of China in the spiritual in between us and God. And then we're like, God, I can't see you. No, no, no duh, Sherlock. Because of the things that we did. But yet that we have one who David is saying, listen, you can break this down like the walls of Jericho if there's repentance. That's a different message though. He says, my iniquity has overtaken me and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head. I love the imagery. I don't know, but I can't count the hairs of my head. Can you? God knows. But he's literally, David, he's literally saying, my iniquities, this is David, by the way. He's doing well with the Lord at this point in time. And he is saying, my iniquities are more than the hairs on my head. And, and because of those things, they're, they're overtaking me. I can't see, I can't, I don't know what you're doing, God. He says, my, there are more than the, the hairs on my head. My heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. My heart fails me. I just want to like, think about that for a second. Do you like, when you're excited about something, even if everyone tells you that you can't do it, do you ever like, your heart is so joyful and so like excited that it doesn't matter what people say because you're just going to run after it. But when your heart fails you, it's almost like you want to give up even if everything's just kind of laid out in front of you, right? It's like, I think sometimes to have our heart fail us would probably be the worst thing because all motivation's gone. Like, everything kind of just like falls apart, even if the path is laid before you. He says, my heart fails me. I hate that. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. Let me just go back to that, I think. I, I think that's super important. Has your heart failed you in like your relationship with God? Has your heart failed you in like what God can do in your life? Has your heart failed you in like believing that his word is, is good and true? Has your heart failed you? Like, have you just like, you're just like, I, I just don't have it in me anymore. I just want to lay down. He continues, he says, be pleased, O Lord, 
to deliver me. O oh Lord, make haste to help me. Let those be put to shame and disappointed altogether. People get joy in putting stumbling blocks in front of you. And David is literally saying, look, let them be disappointed altogether. Who seek to snatch away my life. Listen, folks, if you, you're all here for a reason. No one coerced you to be here, by the way. You made it here. You got up this morning even an hour earlier than you normally would because there was a time change, whether your phone told you or not. And you made it here. And so whether we're feeling low or high or whatever it is, the reality is, is like there is an effort that says, hey, God, like I want something from you. And he continues on, he says, let those be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my hurt. Lord, I pray that right now. Heavenly Father, those who want to delight in the hurt of your people here today, God, let them be turned back. Let it be brought to dishonor. Those who delight in the hurt of your people. Let those be appalled because of their shame. Who say to me, ah, ah, like I gotcha. Oh, there it is. Oh, I see that. See, they're sinning. They're doing this. They're doing that. No. Let it be put to shame. But may all who see you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, great is the Lord. As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord take thought, takes thought for me. Do you guys realize that? The Lord literally takes thought in you. You ever been up on a plane? Those who have, and you look down from the plane. I, I don't know, I have these weird, crazy thoughts all in my head. I'm like, I'm, I'm looking down, I'm like, I can't see anyone. I can't even see cars. I can see maybe some like outlines of like farmland. And I'm like, where's the people? And then my other thought is this, is like, God, I can't even see them and I'm at 30,000 feet. And, like, you take delight in every single one. Like, do you realize that? Like, when you're laying in your bed, you're all alone, God is thinking about you. He's literally, he's like, I'm taking thought in you. Like, let, let that penetrate into your soul. Whether you like it or not, it doesn't really matter. The reality is he's thinking about you. Like, you ever, like, been frustrated at someone? You're like, I don't want you to think about me. Well, too bad. He's thinking about you. No matter how mad you are at God, he's thinking about you. And David's rejoicing in this. He's saying, God, this is what you do. As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought for me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, oh my God. Come to me. Turn to Acts 16 for me. Acts 16, we have this account of uh, Paul and Silas in jail. And I think sometimes this is a great imagery of, like, of our own lives and the realities of the jails that we are currently in. And so, even if you're a believer, congratulations, you can still be in a jail somewhere in your life. You can be, a jail, you can be in jail in your mind. You can be in jail in your soul. You can be in jail in your thought life. You can be in jail in certain temptations that you have here and there, certain secret temptations that no one even knows. You can be in jail in, in wounds of the past that you don't even know are even there. But yet it's capturing your soul, capturing your heart, and yet you feel as though God's not even near. God's not even in this place. These are the thoughts that you feel. I know because I've been there and the Bible says so. But there's an interesting statement here in imagery where Paul and Silas are in jail for obviously uh, casting a demon out of a girl uh, that, was, that were mocking him, them. And, um, and, and they're, 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 they're in jail. And, and uh, it says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Now, I don't know about you, but these inner cells 
where there was no light. It's like solitary confinement. It's, you're there all day. You, you were actually chained to other guards so they wouldn't leave. In fact, uh, the, it, the, the responsibility of guards at the time was so incredible, which we'll talk about in a minute. But the, these, the, the prisoners could not leave. There was no way for them to leave. And they're in there having a praise, praise tune at midnight. And they said this. They were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Do you guys get imagery on this? Like, do you guys create pictures in your mind? I do. Like, I, I create these pictures in my mind, and I'm like, I'm like, wow, like, just think about, like, so close your eyes for a minute. Just think about you're sitting in jail, and maybe you're the one singing songs, and people are listening. Or maybe you're not the one singing songs, and you're hearing others singing songs. You're held captive, you can't go anywhere, you're, you're, you're locked up, and yet at midnight, at generally the hour which we start feeling down and lonely and betrayed and tired and I'm never getting out of here, and all of a sudden, you hear hymns and singing of songs, just like the ones that we were just singing. What would that do for your soul? Like, is that, there would be like such an uplifting that begins to occur... Because the Spirit of God is within the song. Listen, we, you can sing. I've been to churches before, and this is not to down any church, this is just to show you a reality. I've been to churches before where, where you go in and they've got hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of like sound equipment. And it's, it's amazing. Like, I mean, stuff that I wish I had here, right? Yet the worship is deader than a doornail. Flat. Great song, great words, but yet there, it's just, there's, there's something missing. Then I can go to churches like this where we throw stuff together, we duct tape wires, we got loose connections that were teetering in the back of the, of the room like this just so they don't creak and crack. And yet the Spirit of God is like moving in power. Right? And like, and like, what is that? What is that move that's moving my soul? What is it that is causing people to stand up and just say hallelujah for the next 45 minutes? Like, that's weird and strange. Something external has to happen for that to happen. Something needs to move. Something that is intangible, that is moving, that you can't see, yet is, in, that is, 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 is visceral even within your own soul. And begins to move you and cause you to be like, I have to praise. I have to clap my hands. There's something within me that is like, I, like, I, I physically don't want to, but I, oh, there I go. <laughs> Woo! Like, whoa, that's not me. Okay, let's, let's put that back in my pocket. <laughs> like, have you been there, right? I mean, there's something that even like in the, in the most darkest, depressing times, like, Songs that are imbued with the presence of God will radically change you. Listen, God wants to bring freedom and he wants to come your way. And he wants to meet you exactly where you're at. God will find you. There's no place you can run. There's no place you can hide. He will capture your mind, capture your eyes, capture your heart. Uh, let me tell you something. I was, oh, I think it was a couple years ago, I was like going through like a, a personal hard time and I was, I was in Puerto Rico and I was, like, I was feeling like David. I'm like, I'm like, man, I'm like, God, you don't hear me. I'm by myself. I'm having a rough time. And I'm sitting on a rooftop restaurant, super cool, good food, plantains, some meat, and I don't even know what else. It was good, right? Looking over the mountains but super upset in my soul. You ever been there? Like, like everything's good in the sense of like, there's money in the bank. Like, uh, like you're not losing your house tomorrow. Um, like, you know, but yet you just feel dead and empty inside. And you're like, God, where are you? Like things are fine financially. Things are fine, even just life. I mean, there's, there's, there's no like earthquakes happening, but yet God, like, like I don't sense you. I don't feel you. I don't see you. And so I'm sitting on this rooftop restaurant and I hear this 
And it's in Spanish. And I'm like, I know that tune. And I'm like, inside, listen, I start to weep inside. And I'm like, are you kidding me, God? Like, I'm on an island in the middle of the Atlantic. And you came to to, to find me just to, like, encourage me? I'm like, are you kidding? Like, and so now I'm like, I'm, of course, I'm with a bunch of military guys. And I'm like, I'm, like, I'm not going to cry. And, and, but I'm like, hey, I'm like, guys, you want to go get some ice cream? Because I knew there was an ice cream shop next to where this band was playing. And I wanted to go closer. Like, there was something that was drawing me near. I mean, it's like, it's like Moses, he's walking his sheep in, in Exodus 3. And it says that he, he observed a bush on fire and he was intrigued. You ever been intrigued by the presence of God? Where you're walking and you're, something's happening and you're like, it's like, you know, rut row raggy. What was that? It's like, Whoop. and you like, all of a sudden you turn and you, you go to see what this is. Listen, it is the spirit of God that is drawing you. And we have an opportunity at those times to receive or reject And here's the crazy thing. When we consistently reject, our sight of God becomes dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. The more we receive and respond, the brighter and brighter the presence of God is within our lives. And so the question then comes up again, why don't we see God? Why don't we have freedom? What is it that we're bound up like Paul and Silas? Well, guess what? It's time to start singing. And it's time to, to, to sing songs that are just like, listen, it doesn't have to be pretty. It says make a joyful noise, folks. <laughs> Throw a pan against the wall. Well, not if you're angry. But if that's going like, to start your song, then go do it. Don't break anything. But there's like, listen, I'm not that great of a singer, but sometimes I'll just walk around and, and sing by myself. Because the presence of God will move you in ways that you've never thought it could. If you would receive and just say yes. Paul and Silas said yes. And all of a sudden they begin to sing. And here's what begins to happen. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. Hold on a second. At midnight Paul and Silas were were praying and singing hymns. That's cool. And God... Uh, to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. That's cool too. And what's the word? Suddenly. Hold on, what is it again? Suddenly. Do you realize what the devil hates? Worship. Worship. You want to have a spirit-filled time of worship? Go ahead, and you will find chaos within the building too. I mean, I don't know if you guys saw during worship, a Nerf gun, a little Nerf bullet went all the way front from one of the kids. And I'm like, I'm like, what the heck? Right? Listen, if you want to start worshiping God, chaos will be right there. But here's what we need to recognize these things. We need to be a people who are like, I'm going to worship God. And I know that the enemy is going to be right there to try to stop it. And when we start recognizing these things, we see that, if, that, that we are going in the right direction. Listen, if nothing's really happening to you, I would really question our walk with the Lord. Once, once things start getting crazy and buck wild, that's the Jeff Walsh translation, all of a sudden, weirdness will begin to happen. Arguments will begin to occur. Confusion may come into your mind. Praise God, I'm on the right track. Listen, when I was in Iraq, I'm not trying to rhyme here. When I was in Iraq, if nothing was happening, there's no bad guys there. The moment I get shot at, well, I guess I'm in the right place. You're driving around trying to find the grid location. And you're like, I don't know where they are. And all of a sudden you hear uh, bullets hitting off your vehicle. I'm like, we found them. (laughs) 
It's the same thing in the supernatural. It's the same thing. You want to come to church and all of a sudden your car breaks down? You're doing the right thing. You want to begin to worship the Lord and all of a sudden your, your significant other, you have an argument? You're doing the right thing. Push through it. Worship. You want to pursue the call of God and the church begins to talk about you? You're in the right direction. Praise God. Pray, pray with David. Pray. Lord, let it all be put to shame. Listen, the, the things that are not of God will be put to shame irregardless. That is, God will not have it. God will not stand for it. He's a protector of his people. If you are one of his, he will protect you. He will guide you. He will uplift you. It says, my eyes go to and fro throughout all the earth to find one who is righteous to do what? To push him down? No. To lift them up. Do you see that? He says, he goes, I sought for a man who would stand in the gap for me. But I found what? No one. Amen. Folks, we've got a lot of people here that I know will stand in the gap. And so we, like, we see that what's happening here. And there's like this, like, yes, there's a physical uh, uh, prison. Yet there's, there's something supernatural that, that Paul is talking about here and, and explaining this isn't, God isn't just about the physical. We all know that we will pass away one day and either go to heaven or go to hell. Listen, we are here. James literally says our life is but a what? Long adventure? No, a vapor, exactly. Our life is but a vapor. Here today and gone tomorrow. And in that short time frame, we have the gift upon gift upon gift to receive that thing or to push it away. And, and this, this gifting, whether we're 17 years old or whether we are 80-something years old, the realities are we have the opportunities to receive what God wants to give. Think about this for a second. I'm sorry, I'm going off this tangent, but I'm going to... I want to get this into our brains here for a second. You ready for this? Here's what happens. Genesis 1. God says, hey, stars, we're going to be there and you're going to, you're going to hang up there. Hey, the ocean, I'm going to make you get into existence. All right, sounds good. You're going to come to the beach and go no farther. Hey, trees, you're going to, you're going to be planted here. You're going to produce oxygen. And they're like, yes, I'll do that. And the ocean's like, yes, I'll do that. And sun, you stay there. And he's like, yes, I'll do that. And then the moon, you stay there. Yes, I'll do that. And then he gets to the sixth, the seventh day. I'm going to die the sixth day. And he creates man. And all of a sudden, we're like, he's like, all right, what I want you to do is I want you to worship me. I want you to follow me. And I'm going to, I'm going to bless you. And we're like, no. And he's like, Oh, hold on a second. I, I, I made you like, hey, you made, if you say yes, there's good things coming. Like, it's like almost ridiculous. Like, think about this. What a facade it is that Satan puts before our eyes. You ever play video games like in, in, in when you're a kid, maybe like the old Nintendo or something like that. And in these, in these video games, there was a map. Like, remember, remember Zelda? Anyone remember this game? Well, all right. Well, in this game, there was a map, right? And as soon as you start, the entire map is black. Right? That's what it's like with Satan. With God, when you play the game of life, he reveals the entire map. And he says, hey, go wherever you want in this garden. Just stay away from this. I'd like to, that's right. Amen. But Satan's like, oh, there's a lot of good things in there. But I'm not going to reveal it till you just go into that place. And then we're lured by a feeling or a sensation. Or we're lured by a thought that something might give us some, just one more lift. And then we go into that, we're captured, and we're like, here, you ready? Here's what comes. The spirit of shame, and the spirit of guilt, and the spirit of condemnation. Boom! right on your soul, and it just begins to speak to your mind and say, you're nothing, you're worthless, and you'll never get out of this. It might have been five years, it might have been 10 years, it might be 30 years by now. But I'm here to tell you, there is a restoration of freedom that God will bring to your soul. You can't run from it. 
And here's the goodness of God. You ready for this? He's so good. Listen, he wasn't making this command about forgiving seven times 70. And be like, okay, when you get to that number, you're just going to stop. Obviously, he's like, okay, that's infinite. And yes, he's saying it to us. But God does not say anything that he doesn't do himself. And so, oftentimes in our weird, strange minds, we're like, oh God, you command us to do these things, but you're not going to do them for us. And so the 1,492nd time that we fall into our temptation or issue or garbage or bad language or just being mean to people or upset or grumpy or angry or whatever the issue is that you have, God never wants you running away with your tail between your legs like a dog. Never. Never. He literally says, come to me, all you who are what? Weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Come to me. Well, what does that look like? Well, it looks like singing and hymns. And you, you feel like garbage? Throw on some worship music. You got a phone? Throw it on. He says this. He says, And suddenly there was a, what? A great earthquake. So that the, what? Foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's, what? Bonds were unfastened. This is, isn't just physical, folks. This is in the, super, this is in the supernatural This is in your soul. This is what happens when we worship. This is what happens when we come to the Lord. This is what happens if you haven't been to an all-night prayer. This is what happens overnight. Midnight comes, one o'clock comes, two o'clock comes, bonds start to break. The foundation of your soul start to shake. And, And captives are released. It just happened right here. On our last time, our last overnight prayer. We're praying it wasn't planned. And we're praying through certain things. And a person comes and all of a sudden, they're getting deliverance from demons. And things are leaving them. And their lives are changing. And they're not doing the things they once did. Shocker. That's God. So I guess what's like, what's amazing to me is how long did it take to make this prison? Physically. How long has it taken to make the prisons of our souls that we are currently in? And do you realize that in one night, one time of prayer, one time of just pursuing God, the foundations are broke and the chains are loosed? If we are willing to receive. There's always this key word if. I'm amazed. I'm absolutely amazed. He says, and suddenly there was a great earthquake and immediately all the doors were opened. This isn't like, oh, if you just linger around and you tarry around for a while, maybe God will show up. No. Can I give you a theology of the supernatural work? You ready? Here's the statement. Expect God's going to do everything, but don't tell him how to do it. Every time you come to church, I expect you're going to move my life. But I'm not going to tell you to do it. I'm just going to hang out and receive. Whatever you want to do in me, God, you want to poke at something that I did when I was five years old, bring it on. Let's do it. Because I want to receive whatever it is you have, God. You want to give me a big Holy Ghost hug? Oh, please do, because I want one of those. You want to bring up something I did 20 years ago? All right, God, I don't really want to do that, but I'm going to receive. Because I, God never, ever, ever, ever shines the light into our soul to reveal something 20 years ago to condemn us, ever. He says in Romans, there is therefore now what? No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if there is condemnation from your peers to your left and to your right, well, I would argue they're not in Christ Jesus. And, and here's what happens all of a sudden. The foundations break. The chains loosen. If we just say yes. Like that's weird and like oddly intriguing. Like the burning bush. 
Like, you're saying I don't have to, like, do anything, God? Well, sure, you got to respond. But this is a free gift that God does. It's a response to just say, God, I don't have this thing figured out. But I want to know you more. God, I don't know what it says in Leviticus. That's a huge, weird book. But I want to know you more. God, I don't understand this book of numbers, why you had some accountant write up all these numbers. But I want to know you more. Verse 29, and the jailer called for lights and rushed in. Listen, even the jailer going in had to bring light. Do you see this? Like, like God brings the light of Christ into the darkness of your soul and lights it up when we sing, when we praise, when we pray. The foundations shake, bonds are broken. And the light of Christ begins to come in and, and, and all of a sudden, people start getting saved. It may start with you. It may go to your husband or your spouse or your friend, or then it may go to your child. It may go to your mom, your dad. It may go to your sister, brother. Do you see how God works? He's going to start with you. And all of a sudden he's going to start working in your entire family. If you don't believe me, let's read it. And they said, believe in the Lord. Excuse me. And they ran in and, and they brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the what? Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. And you and your, one more time, you and your, this gift isn't just for you. This is the gift that keeps on giving. It will not run out, ever. In fact, if you read Ezekiel, it just gets deeper and wider. The river flowing out from the throne room of heaven. Read it, it's a good, it's a good account of God's presence in your life. Turn with me to uh, Genesis 20 for a second. I want to close out with this. God wants to restore you. He wants to bring life back into you. He doesn't just want to bring you back to where you were. He wants to grow you into something new. Whether you have been a believer for 20, 30 years, he's still growing you. And he wants to bring you farther. Whether you were a believer way back when and things happen and God wants to bring you even farther than you were then. Whether you've just been struggling and you've been like just like pounding away at trying to do the right thing. Here's, here's what I'd argue. You ready for this one? Look at me for a second. If, if you're trying to do the right thing, I'm going to say stop doing that. You're like, what are you talking about, Jeff? I'm glad you asked. Stop trying to do the right thing and just hang out with Jesus. I'll say it again, just for the chaos in the background. Stop trying to do the right thing and just hang out with Jesus. Let his presence wash over your soul. The spirit of God is not a litany of do's and don'ts. It never is. Read Galatians. This is the fruits of the spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. It says, apart from these, there is no law. Listen, God came to fulfill the law. We live in a greater covenant. One that his presence, it says the law is written on our hearts. He thinks about you. He wants to just hang out with you. And yes, he's going to point things out in your soul. That's what a good father does. The Bible says that we would be derelict children if the Lord didn't point things out. And so we receive, respond, and we move forward. But I want to I want to read this uh, in about Jacob. See, Jacob uh, was a man who was a, a, a swindler. He was de- he was deceitful. He stole things. This this dude this shouldn't be anywhere near the presence of God according to the Old Testament. But yet God does a mighty work in him and he's walking around and he's doing things and there's, there's certain uh, portion of his time, but he gets to this place and mind you, Jacob's like, I want to see God. I want to, I want to know that you're here, but he doesn't see God anywhere. And I wonder if like some of us don't see God in your life working. Remember, Jacob was a swindler at this time. He's, he's coming out of, coming out of this, trying to do the right thing. And then he's walking across this land and he 
takes a rock and he lays it down and he lays his head on the rock and he has a dream. You ready for this dream? Check this out. And behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth. This is the dream that he had. And at the top, it reached to heaven. Behold, the angel of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. Remember, this is a statement that is said over and over again to remind the people, I haven't left you. I'm the God of your father. I'm the God of your grandfather. I'm the God of your great-grandfather. I'm the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I haven't left. And I'm going to do a work, he says, right? And he says, I'm showing you this in this dream. And he says, I am the Lord. The God of Abraham, the, 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 uh, the father and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth and you shall spread abroad in the west and to the east. 15, behold, ready this for this? I am what? Say it again. I am. God is saying what? He is with you. This is Jacob. He can't see anything yet. God gives him a dream. He says, I am with you to bring you back into this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. This is a promise for every single person in this room. You say, well, it's not for me. Well, that's not true. There's, a, there's this thing called provenient grace that even if we are not believers, God is drawing us and he's pulling the strings of our heart. And he's saying, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest if you would just receive what I have to give you. And that is newness of life. Now let me just fast forward. Go to the book of John. Remember this dream that Jacob had? The book of John. Go to John 1. Go to verse uh, 48. As Nathanael said to him, he's talking to Jesus, how do you know me? Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Listen, Jesus sees everything. He got this guy coming to Jesus. This is, this is the son of God. This is God himself. And he's like, how do you know me? And he's like, dude, I saw you under the fig tree. There's other scripture says, I knew you when you were in your mother's womb. He says, I knit you together. I know all the number of the hairs on your head. I know the plans I have for you, not to what? Harm you, but to prosper you, to bring you goodness. Then he says this, Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under a fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And here we go. And he said to him, truly, truly, this is amen, amen, which means the truth, which is usually said at the end of prayers. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Amen. Meaning the truth. It is done. It is finished. This is the truth. Jesus says, hey, before I even say it, this is already true. You can take it to the bank. You don't even need to figure it out. I'm just telling you this is true before I even say it. And here's what he says. Truly, truly. I say to you, you will see heaven opened. And the what? And the what? The angels of God ascending and descending on what? The Son of Man. Listen, Jacob's ladder, the ladder was Jesus. He is the open door to heaven. He, Jesus is the only way that we can communicate in anything into the supernatural. Jesus is the, is the life he is the, the only way that we can have any access into heaven. He is the only way that we can have any access to even thinking or having joy or life or any presence with God. Like, do you see how, like, radical this is? And he literally says, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, Acts 16 says, and you shall be saved. I would argue this one too. If there's been some backsliding and some like, just, I'm just like on an ice skating rink and the wind's blowing me to the side of the rink and I've just been pushed up against the wall for the last month, year, 
two years, 10 years, whatever it is. I would argue this one too. What must I do to get back skating again? What must I do to get back in what you have called me to do, Lord? He says, belief. The, the formula doesn't change. The formula is the same. God knows how human we are. And change isn't good for us sometimes. That's why God always stays the same. And he literally says, no matter what you have gone through, no matter what you are currently going through, if you believe, if you say, God, I was once here and I don't want to be back there, but I want to be much farther along, he just says, believe. Trust in me. I will move you. You say, God can't do it. I say, you're full of it. God can do it. I've seen it. God can do it. And God will do it. I want to pray for you. I want to give this, uh, you know what? Let's pray what Jacob prayed. You ready for this one? Go back to Genesis 28. And we will truly end with this one. Ready for this? Jacob 28, 20. Here we go. You ready? It says this. It says, Then Jacob made a vow saying this, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I, I come again to my father's house in peace. You heard that? He, he wants peace then the Lord shall be my God. This is what I would ask. If this is what you want in your life, this is what I ask we pray. And you can just pray with me. You can close your eyes. You can come to the altar if you want. We're going to sing. And then we're going to celebrate what God just did by taking communion. And so Lord Jesus, if you will keep us, if you will give us bread, the bread of life, if you will sustain us, Lord, if you will give me the, the, the energy to get out of with the mess I'm in, Father, you will be my God. For those who have just been wandering, here's your prayer. Heavenly Father, forgive me for I have sinned against you. And I have also, forg- uh, I have also sinned against, and you just fill in the blank. Father, forgive me. I don't want that. So, Father, I open up my my hands to you. I open up my heart to you, Lord God. And I ask you to fill me anew. Do in me only what you can do, God. Pour your Holy Spirit into my soul. For I need you to do the work in me. And I receive you, Jesus. I receive your Spirit. Father, I receive your healing. Lord, I receive your forgiveness. And I thank you that as we sing and as we pray, it will be like Acts 16 in a moment where the strongholds will be broken, where chains will be loosed. And my God, you will change our lives forever, Father. Let it be so in Jesus' name. Let's sing. Let's worship. Let's let some bonds be broken and then we will worship in communion.